When he was just 12 years old, Martin Pistorius came down with a strange illness that puzzled his parents and doctors and left him in a coma. Doctors told his parents to prepare for the worst, but Martin clung to life in an apparently vegetative state for more than a decade. When Martin miraculously woke up from his coma 12 years later, he remembered everything. He had been trapped in his body, unable to communicate with the world going on around him, but fully aware of everything happening around him and to him for years. Martin's illness started out normally enough. He was suffering from headaches, nausea, and vomiting, symptoms that seemed to point to a common flu. But then things took a turn for the worse. The formerly rambunctious preteen's personality completely changed. He seemed reserved, slept all the time, and eventually stopped talking and making eye contact altogether. Soon he was unable to feed himself, walk, or even get out of bed. Martin's parents took him to doctor after doctor, but they were just as confused as his parents were. There was no obvious reason for his symptoms, and nothing the doctors tried made Martin feel any better. In fact, he continued to get worse, first becoming wheelchair-bound and eventually slipping into a coma. Martin's doctors were mystified. They weren't exactly sure what caused these mysterious symptoms, but their best guess was an extremely rare case of cryptococcal meningitis. Meningitis is an infection of the meninges, the membranes covering the brain and spinal cord. Cryptococcus neoformans, or CM for short, is an incredibly rare form of meningitis, usually diagnosed in people who have compromised immune systems. Early symptoms include headache, nausea, and vomiting, and mental changes like confusion and personality changes. If left untreated, CM can lead to brain damage, coma, and even death. The neoformans fungus that causes most cases of CM is found in soil all over the world particularly soil that contains bird droppings. If a doctor suspects CM based on the patient's symptoms, they'll perform a painful spinal tap to confirm the diagnosis. The infection can be treated with antifungal medication, which usually needs to be taken indefinitely. But since most people who contract CM are already immunocompromised, the infection can often be fatal. In Martin's case, his doctors believed that the infection had run rampant and caused his body to enter a coma state, which led them to believe that his prognosis was not good. After more than two years in a coma, the doctors told Martin's parents that he likely wouldn't ever wake up, and that if he did, he would likely have the mind of a three-year-old. They took him home, made him as comfortable as possible, and did their best to adjust to their new normal. A coma is a state of prolonged unconsciousness characterized by depressed brainstem reflexes. A comatose person's pupils will not respond to light, and their bodies show no response to painful stimuli. A coma can be caused by a head injury, a stroke, a brain tumor, or an underlying illness or infection, as in Martin's case. Most comas last only a few weeks, and medical attention is crucial to preserving brain functioning even during that short time. If a coma lasts more than a few weeks, the patient will likely transition to a persistent vegetative state. After more than one year in a coma, it's highly unlikely that the person will wake up. Throughout Martin's ordeal, his parents' life revolved around caring for their comatose son. Every morning, Martin's father would wake up early to dress Martin before dropping him off at the care facility where he spent his days. Eight hours later, after a full day of work, his father would return to pick him up from the facility and bring him home. After bathing him and putting him to bed, Martin's father would set his alarm to go off every two hours so that he could get up and turn Martin over to help prevent bed sores. Their lives continued like this for more than a decade, with Martin's parents continuing to love and care for their son despite the fact that doctors had told them that the Martin they knew was gone. At best, they said he had the mind of a three-year-old, and if he was even aware at all. At least that's what they thought. Meanwhile, Martin was aware of everything that was going on around him. About two years after he fell into his coma, Martin's mind woke up, with his intellect fully intact, although the rest of his body remained immobile, and he was trapped in a body that couldn't move, speak, or even make eye contact. But Martin could hear and see everything that was going on around him, and he remembered everything. In one of the care facilities that he spent time at, the staff would dump him in front of a TV playing children's shows for hours on end. Day after day, he sat helpless in front of the TV, with nothing but reruns of the Barney and Friends TV show to focus on. To this day, Martin cannot overstate how much he hates Barney. But annoying kids' shows were the least of the abuses he experienced. Everyone around Martin, his parents, his doctors, and the caretakers watching over him all believed that Martin was in a vegetative state, unaware of his surroundings and unable to speak up or protect himself. For some monstrous individuals, Martin appeared to be the perfect victim, helpless, silent, and oblivious, and the way they treated him was truly shocking. Martin remembers every detail of the abuse he experienced at a care facility after care facility. Some of the caregivers seemed to get a little too much enjoyment from the act of testing his response to painful stimuli. He remembered being pinched, slapped, and even hit routinely in a way that was clearly not meant to be therapeutic. 
He was left alone outside in the blistering heat and left wet and shivering for hours after a bath. In one particularly gruesome incident, Martin remembers a nurse feeding him his own vomit as punishment for not being able to stop himself from throwing up after being fed scalding hot food. He even remembers experiencing sexual abuse at the hands of those who were meant to be caring for him and protecting him. But perhaps worst of all was the mental abuse. Thinking that Martin was in a vegetative state and unaware, caregivers would routinely hurl abuse at him. They called him names like freak, dummy, donkey, a heap of rubbish, and those were the milder ones. The lowest point though came when his own mother told him she wished he would die. Martin was shocked and hurt. How could his own mother wish death on him? Amazingly though, Martin was able to use those feelings as fuel and began to take control of his own mind. If he couldn't escape his physical situation, he was going to do his best to escape mentally and preserve whatever sanity he had left. Martin survived the abuse in isolation by learning to disengage his mind. He said, you simply exist, it's a very dark place to find yourself because, in a sense, you're allowing yourself to vanish. Martin developed coping mechanisms, like tracking the sun's shadow as it moved across the room, watching insects and having conversations with himself in his head. As he strengthened his mind, Martin began to have compassion for his mother and her harsh words. He realized when she looked at him, all she could see was the son she had lost. To her, it was like her son had died when he was 12 years old. Martin could tell she was in pain and often worried that she wasn't a good mother, wasn't taking good enough care of him. The worst part was that Martin could do nothing to ease her fears. Finally, after more than a decade trapped in an immobile body and unable to communicate, Martin experienced the first ray of hope. A new caretaker was compassionate enough to see Martin as a person, not just a body. She actually looked into his eyes and spoke to him, not just at him. And she was the first person in nearly a decade to notice that Martin appeared to show signs of comprehension when she spoke to him. Verna van der Walt would later say that she could tell by the sparkle in his eyes that Martin was conscious and trying to communicate. She managed to convince his parents to take him for extensive cognitive testing, where they got the shock of a lifetime. Martin's mind was perfectly healthy. He was awake and aware, and he remembered everything. This discovery was only the very first step on a long, hard road to recovery, but it was the hope that Martin and his parents had been dreaming of for more than a decade. Martin underwent extreme rehabilitation to begin repairing the damage caused by more than a decade of immobility. After years of inactivity, his muscles had atrophied and he had lost many of his fine motor skills. Martin had to relearn many of the activities of daily living that we take for granted. How to sit up, how to dress and bathe himself, how to feed himself, even how to use his hands. He also had to relearn how to communicate, which he did with the help of a computer. Martin is still confined to a wheelchair and he may never walk again, but he's well on his way to living a full and independent life. In fact, Martin went on to live a shockingly normal life after his ordeal. He graduated university, got a job as a computer programmer, and even married the love of his life. In 2013, Martin wrote a book about his experience called Ghost Boy, the miraculous escape of a misdiagnosed boy trapped inside his own body, which became a New York Times bestseller. Talk about an inspirational story. While Martin's story seems almost too crazy to believe, some doctors are worried that it's an all too common occurrence. Dr. Adrian Owen is the author of Into the Gray Zone, a neuroscientist explores the boundary between life and death. Dr. Owen believes that 15 to 20% of all patients in persistent vegetative states or unresponsive wakefulness are actually conscious and trapped in their own bodies. He spent more than 20 years working with these patients to help better understand the gray zone between consciousness and unconsciousness. In his book, Dr. Owen provides countless examples of patients whose situation is remarkably similar to Martin's. Take Kate, for example, who found herself in a persistent vegetative state after contracting encephalomyelitis, another type of inflammation of the brain and spinal cord tissues. A PET scan showed that Kate's brain responded normally when she was shown pictures of her loved ones. Luckily, Kate recovered from her vegetative state after six months. Another shocking example is the case of Kevin, a 53-year-old bus driver who fell into a coma after suffering a major stroke. FMRI scans showed brain activity consistent with a normal response when Kevin was asked to listen to complex sentences. In another case, a patient named Scott had been comatose for 12 years after a car accident, but his family was adamant that he was still in there. Dr. Owen asked Scott to picture himself playing tennis and the very specific area of our brain associated with playing sports, the premotor cortex, lit up exactly as it would for a healthy person. Scott was even able to answer simple yes or no questions by imagining tennis when the answer was no. Prior to Dr. Owen's work, doctors believed that once someone had been in a persistent vegetative state for a few months, there was zero chance of recovery. 
This assumption had not only left untold thousands of patients suffering in silence, but it also led to some catastrophic scenarios, like the Venezuelan man named Carlos Camejo who had been unconscious for 10 years following a car accident, only to awaken during his own autopsy. Many people in this situation, like Kate, have even attempted to commit suicide by holding their breath, hoping to exert what little control they had over their own lives. Doctors and researchers are working to better understand the gray zone of consciousness, so that hopefully no one will ever have to go through what Martin, Kate, and the thousands of others trapped in their own bodies had to endure. In the meantime, Martin has some advice for us. Treat everyone with kindness, dignity, compassion, and respect, irrespective of whether you think they understand or not. Never underestimate the power of the mind, the importance of love and faith, and never stop dreaming. If you thought this video about being trapped in your own body was terrifying, be sure and check out our other videos, like this harrowing tale titled I Was Trapped in a Canyon for 127 Hours. This will give you something to think about next time you're trapped in an uncomfortable situation. As always, thanks for watching, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.